Uh, welcome to everyone to the Vegans and Vegetarians for Organic Regenerative Agriculture uh, panel discussion tonight. I am Sherry Duggar, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself and then introduce our panelists for tonight. I will be moderating the discussion. Um, this is hosted by Organic Consumers Association as part of the Boycott Big Meat campaign that was launched earlier this summer. And uh, you can find out more about that campaign on Facebook as well as on their website. So I came to vegetarianism through the trifecta of good reasons for not eating meat. Um, it was a decision born from my belief that it was good for animals, good for the environment, and good for my health. That said, at the time that I stopped eating meat, I found myself in the strange place of advocating for family farmers and for animal food production as the executive director of Indiana Farmers Union. I also served as a consultant for the Humane Society of the United States, Earth Justice, and American Grassfed Association. And I now serve as executive director of Socially Responsible Agricultural Project, which is an organization that mobilizes communities to push back against the industrial food systems that extract the health, wealth, and quality of life from rural communities. Through all of these positions, I have advocated against industrial agriculture and on behalf of better food systems, specifically for local and regional food systems that put the environment, animal welfare, family farms, rural communities, and public health over corporate profits. It didn't actually become an uncomfortable place to be as a vegetarian advocating for animal agriculture until I stood behind a table at a national grass fed conference. It was there that I realized the true divide between vegetarians, vegans, and regenerative agriculture farmers, though we were all in many aspects fighting against the same enemies and calling for the same climate focused solutions. The solution I have since come to understand is not an either or situation. We must reduce meat consumption, yes, and we also must advocate for a better food system, one built on working in concert with nature rather than against it. And so that's why we are gathered here tonight to discuss how organic and regenerative farming can help to address the problems in our world that negatively impact humans and animals alike. Climate change, pandemics, uh, polluted air and water, decimated rural communities, and depleted soils are all a result of our modern industrial food system. This is a system that claims it can feed the world, but at what cost? We can and must do better, and it is on this platform that vegans, vegetarians, and regenerative agriculture producers can agree. I'm honored to be moderating this discussion tonight with such esteemed panelists whom I'm like, I would like to introduce you to here. And first, we will be hearing from David Bronner. David is a Cosmic Engagement Officer, otherwise known as the CEO of Dr. Bronner's, the top selling brand of natural foods, or <laughs> natural foods, natural soaps in North America, and producer of a range of organic body care and food products. David established Dr. Bronner's as a sustainable leader in the natural products industry by becoming one of the first body care brands to certify its soaps, lotions, balms, and other personal care products under the USDA National Organic Program in 2003. In 2017, David led Dr. Bronner's in co-founding Regenerative Organic Certification along with Patagonia and the Rodale Institute to encompass the highest bar soil health, animal welfare, and fair labor standards in one program in the interest of growing a truly sustainable and ecological alter alternative to industrial agriculture. David has lived a vegan lifestyle since 1997. He has also directed over $3 million in donations to the animal rights movement since 2013 to support efforts to end factory farming and reduce the suffering of animals raised for food. So with that, David, I will let you uh, take the floor and, and um, make your statement. Um, right on. Yeah, well, I guess, um, uh, you know, starting with my decision to become vegan um, was, uh, I was in Amsterdam after college and, um, intersected the cannabis cup 1995 cannabis cup and um had uh, just a, a lot of awakenings on a lot of levels uh, and, um, it, but in particular with psychedelic medicine and in this time uh came to understand that the drug war was in large part a religious war on the sacraments of of our people as a proxy to go after activists of the counterculture and before that uh, african americans and mexican americans and really that was my real political awakening and um, I was in a squat with uh, a couple kind of hippie vegetarian, really sweet cats, but, you know, cannabis warriors. And they were, um, they had founded a church in Arkansas uh, in 1993 with cannabis as a sacrament, as a First Amendment uh, religious challenge, uh, constitutional challenge to the drug war. And they're facing 10 years of life if they set foot back in the States. And, you know, it was just, you know, it was just like, really, it was like, what kind of country do I live in where that, that happens? And 
you know, and, and, and was going through a big revaluation. Why, why do I think what I think? Why do I do what I do? And, um, and among others, so that these guys came at me like, you know, yeah, why are you eating meat? And, you know, and, you know, and I'm like, well, why do I do that? And, you know, and like, I love meat. It tastes great. You know, I love barbecuing my dad. I've done it every day of my life. But, you know, I, I'm realizing in a cannabis meditation, I have a knife I'm, when I'm in the store and I can, you know, kill that cow if I want, but maybe I don't want to do that. And I'll just cut down some vegetables and do that and let the cow do its thing. So that was basically the kind of simple um, step I took to embracing for as a vegetarian. And then with some more insight into the kind of horse show of dairy and just conventional dairy practices completed, uh, became uh, totally vegan. Um, and yeah, I was very committed to that and was very activist, you know, long story short, we you know, put hemp seed oil on the soaps in 99 and got in a big fight uh, on that front um, and um, with DEA. But, but hemp was really my entree. Hemp was at the nexus of both drug policy reform as one of the most ridiculous examples of an out of control drug policy uh, that would schedule a non-drug agricultural crop as a schedule one substance. So it was an opportunity to really land body blows on the drug war and, you know, with the ultimate aim of integration of cannabis and psychedelic allies to help heal itself in a really deep way and help awaken higher levels of, of conscience and consciousness and, and uh, awareness and be able to engage on the social and environmental uh, challenges we have. But it's also an amazing sustainable agricultural crop and um, you know, it was really my first foray into agriculture. And you know, at first I was kind of drank the hemp Kool-Aid, like hemp was the solution to every single one of our planetary problems. But uh, eventually I realized that it's not so much about hemp, it's about a management approach to agriculture generally, and that every crop can be grown in a regenerative way or in a degenerative way. Um, you know, hemp's often touted as like, and it rightly so, it grows like a weed, you don't need a lot of herbicides and pesticides uh, to grow it, but often, all too often is grown in a very degenerative, not, not regenerative fashion. And, taking palm on the other end of the spectrum, all, you know, is, is demonized as the, is the worst crop in the world. And indeed, it's generally grown in these monocultures uh, in Borneo and Indonesia, and it's a hor horrible disaster, ripping up rainforests and rain habitat and displacing farming communities off their land and on, become slave or uh, plantation workers for slave wages and, you know, all, all the horrors of that. But there's nothing intrinsic to palm that makes it really bad. And um, and that, in fact, you can grow it in a dynamic ag forestry uh, system, which we're doing now in Ghana with, with intercropping with cocoa and banana and cassava and replicating a wild ecosystem uh, and minimizing weed and pest pressure, maximizing yields, uh, doubling yields versus monoculture blocks of the same crops, um, boosting farmer incomes and yields. And yeah, and just really realizing that agriculture is such a down, industrial agriculture is such a, a horrendous force on, on the planet and is such a contributor to so many problems of, you know, greenhouse gases and, and rural economic collapse and, and poisoning our waters and our bodies, but that it's also the solution. And, um, and going in a real deep dive in the last five years, especially visiting like Gabe Brown and Rodale and David Vedder's farm and visiting farmers who are, you know, really farming in this next level regenerative fashion, you know, with you know, smart rotational crops, understanding what crops should go in what sequence to build soil fertility and are, you know, before a heavy, heavy nitrogen feeder and, you know, and just doing the hyper variable calculus that a good farmer does. And, and like David Vetter, he's like does four years of cropping and then he does four years of pasture and does rotational grazing of ruminants through there. And, you know, and just really understanding the way, especially ruminants can really help uh, you know, build the fertility of a, of a farm and, uh, you know, speed the soil biology. And, and you know, I, I mean, I do believe there is such a thing as veganic agri agriculture and you can do set, uh, what a cow's doing mechanically. But, um, you know, basically I, I have very little problem in a relative sense or, or very pr pretty much none at all. If, if the, the cows are being managed in a humane way and they're able to fulfill their instinctual behaviors, lead, lead a life worth living, uh, have a quick, humane, clean death. You know, that's not that far from the vegan utopia of rewilding as much of the earth as we can and having natural predation and predator-prey relations and, um, and you know, in, in, a, in a farm like that. And, you know, and then there's like things like rifle shot harvesting in the, in the field that is like the, you know, and, you know, control the atmosphere killing. And so, it's a, you know, next level humane ways of, of slaughter. And 
So, um, so yeah, so I've come to understand that I'm in solidarity with high level pasture based livestock operators. Uh, our common enemy is this industrial factory farming machine that's eating us for lunch, that, you know, raising these animals in cages that is just so abysmal and ho horrible and feeding them GMO grain they weren't involved to eat. Um, but if we like get them out of their ca cages, dress and reduce the numbers so that we have a balance in our farming ecosystems, like in a wild ecosystem, there's a, there is such a thing as a balance of animal and plant life. We can replicate that in a, in a farming ecosystem and obviously biodynamic approaches. Um, so regenerative organic is a standard that, you know, basically celebrates what good organic biodynamic farmers are already doing. Um, you know, farming like a, an organism. Uh, and highest, you know, in, in pasture-based animal welfare criteria and fair labor, uh, bringing it all together holistically. You know, we fought with OCA on the, against the GMO machine and a lot of the allies here in Elizabeth, and and you know, we went to the mat on uh, in a huge fight. And but ultimately, that was okay. You know, that's just like the tip of a horrible machine. And you know, even if we got rid of GMOs overnight, that doesn't solve our disastrous problem. And so the ROC is really about focusing on a, on, a, on the ultimate solution. And building from there and trying to transform global agriculture to uh, to a way where everyone on the farm is winning um, and uh, you're growing a market in partnership. Thank you. So, That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. And we'll have questions after everyone speaks. So if you have a question, please go ahead and put your question in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can either directly or let the speakers uh, answer those questions. Um, after David, we're going to hear from uh, Professor Elizabeth Kucinich, who works with domestic and international organizations, businesses, and government to strengthen those who work to bring social, economic, health, agricultural, and ecological systems into balance. She and her husband were vegans in Congress before it was cool. Elizabeth was instrumental in founding the U.S. Uh, Congressional Staff Vegetarian Caucus. She worked to support the establishment of the Plant-Based Foods Association, the Organic Farmers Association, and the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. She is a former board policy chair of the Riddell Institute and currently sits on the board of Groundswell International promoting agroecology. Elizabeth also uh, executive produced the award-winning documentary GM, GMO OMG and is currently a producer of Organic Rising. So thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us and I'll let you talk. You're on mute. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, it's great to be with you all. And I have been longing for this discussion because I see this warring factions that should not be warring. We should be learning from each other. And if anything that my life has really shown is, is that and being married to Dennis Kucinich, who is the man of understanding how to make peace, it's been helpful for me to start to think about how we truly have this conversation wholly and openly with the regenerative agriculture sector and the vegan community. So thank you so much for hosting this. So my, um, my entree into all of this was my mother. Um, when I was about five years old, she almost died from Crohn's disease. And when she was diagnosed, it wasn't really sure how to cure it. And I think that most conventional medicine doesn't really know how to deal with it. Um, so she decided to, instead of take the, the doctor's advice of having large sections of her uh, digestive system removed, um, to actually look at um, a, a whole grains plant-based diet. And that's what she did. And within a very short period of time, she'd managed to heal herself. Um, and that's to do with restoring the microbiome and, and all of those things that now become, you know, chic and cool to be talking about and everybody seems to know about it, but back then was very new. So it was interesting because my mum became vegetarian but my family or her side of the family were small scale cattle farmers and around the dinner table was always quite interesting when I would meet with my great aunt and uncle and my mum would, would eat vegetarian and they would always have this discussion. Um, so I know how contention it can, contentious it can be within a family setting. But what was wonderful about this journey with my mother is that it started you know, as a five year old and moving on and seeing this skeletal woman turn now into this amazing community healer. She runs a healing and teaching sanctuary just outside London was a great lesson to me. Number one, don't always listen to authority, question what is right for yourself and really listen to the inner wisdom that is our bodies and to, to learn to have that relationship. Um, 
we started to look at the food system after she got ill and then when she got better. And I became a member of Compassion in World Farming at a very early age in the United Kingdom. I'm very happy to say that they've now got a branch here in the United States. So hello to everybody there. Um, the executive director of Compassion in World Farming had just joined the organization when I was a child. And he was actually there helping to educate on how to lobby. So this was an adult organization, but I was very active. And so from my, um, my childhood, I started to lobby Parliament on uh, different animal welfare in agriculture issues. Um, fast forwarding, I, um, I came to America, met my husband, and Dennis had had very similar experiences. He had been diagnosed with Crohn's disease, he had almost died, and instead of changing his diet, he'd actually gone the conventional route, had a lot of operations, had Crohn's disease suppressed by all of these different medications, and then thank goodness he met a lady who was vegan and she said, have you tried actually changing your diet? And, you know, of course, doctors had said, no, this isn't the way to go. You know, food has nothing to do with your di di digestive health. It's all something to do with something else. So meeting Dennis and actually hearing his story of transition and understanding the microbiome and how he'd used Chinese medicine to overcome some of his woes and change his diet to plant-based was really instructive to me. And um, Dennis introduced me to actually Ocean's um, dad, to John Robbins. And um, I remember reading Diet for a New America and really seeing how integrated not only agriculture was for animal welfare but how it was with the environment and that to me was was quite remarkable um, I also read Will Tuttle's book The World Peace Diet which I think is extremely instructive to people who are looking at the deeper ethos of the consciousness that we bring into our own lives into our physical health and into the world um, with, with Dennis's journey and all of those things, um, after he'd run for president in 07, I joined the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and I became their director of government affairs and we were looking at prevention and reversal of disease through plant-based nutrition. And what was wonderful learning, working with nutritionists was, was I was learning all of these things about dietary approaches, but what I noticed was that there wasn't so much of an understanding of um, of the, the greater ecology of, of chemicals in agriculture, of genetic engineering. And in Congress, Dennis had really carried the water from the mid 1990s, calling for safety testing, regulations of all different kinds of sort, labeling, et cetera, of GMOs. And I, we moved very um, strongly and swiftly into that. And I transitioned to work with with the um, uh, from the physicians committee into the center for food safety where we were looking at issues of drugs in meat chemicals in agriculture climate change um, closing the carbon cycle all those kinds of things but we in that perspective i learned a lot about you know that aspect of the food system so i'd, I'd learned about nutrition and i learned about the, all of the different regulatory structures and the chemicals but it wasn't until i became an active board member of the rodale institute that i really got my education more into the farm perspective into land into soil health into production into the economics of agriculture and food production because very often people who enter the food movement from a consumer perspective uh, are, are looking at it from from certain eyes and we're really entrained through the media that we read and see that you know it's the farmers who are the bad, bad people but it really isn't and uh, but it, it sounds really stupid to, to to actually say that out loud but it's really a perspective that that is you know at the fore that they are the people we have to fight with and it's not it's a system of really of colonization the farmers themselves in an industrial food system have been colonized as much as the animals or the genetically engineered grain have and so we need to have this holistic perspective of how the world works how our body ecology works the consciousness that we bring to the table and what it is that we want to see um, and as I say, Rodale was a was a, um, a great uh, lesson for me. But then learning from Mark Shepard, who has written the book Restoration Agriculture, and more recently from Reginaldo Haslett Marroquin, who looks at um, poultry-based um, permaculture systems. It's been very interesting for me to look now got from what Rodel really focused on more is sort of the, the making row crops regenerative, looking into three-dimensional plantings, into looking at mimicking the natural world and how the natural world feeds itself and turning that into what a farm looks like in planting complementary kinds of foods in a th three-dimensional system. That has really enabled me to liberate my thinking into this space. And so as we move um, 
into this conversation of looking at regeneration and, and the potential of me eating meat or the choice not to eat meat, I think we really have to look into the deeper levels of thinking. And as I said, you know, there's a colonial mindset and this is devoid of race. This is absolutely about an actual thought set, which is about domination, subjugation, control. And we see that there is always this, this approach. So with, with my mother, they didn't understand what was going on in her body so that they said, okay, drugs and surgery. Um, if we look at what, what is going on with our, with our war in agriculture, the war on weeds, what is it? It's chemicals, it's drugs, or it's tilling, or it's something. You know, it's always that dominant mindset. So we need to start to look at actually what it is to create relationship within a system and be able to move that forward. And to move away from that dominant theology, if you read the Bible and look at Genesis, and you can read it in two ways. Do, were we given dominion over the world, or were we given stewardship of the world? It, it, this is we have gone through in our Western mindset the dominion over so we have to stop slash burning and poisoning everything that we don't understand and dominating it from the seed to the cancer to the war on terror it's exactly the same response to actually learning now how to cultivate those relationships and in this conversation what we need to do initially and really really um, consciously is to cultivate the relationship that is the compassion community of vegan and vegetarians and the compassion community of regenerative agriculture farmers and specialists and come together in union and understanding that we, cut, that we are here really to, to walk a very similar path that manifests very differently. Such a great message. I, I want to come back to that. Um, I hope that we can speak to that a little bit more later. Thank you for, for uh, sharing your thoughts on that with, with the group here, Elizabeth. Um, third, we're going to hear from Ocean Robbins, who is an author, speaker, facilitator, father, dancer, and movement builder as co-founder and CEO of the 500,000 plus member Food Revolution Network. He has led hundreds of retreats and events for leaders from 65 plus nations. He's written books, mentored, and learned from some of the world's most inspiring change makers, and has been a creative partner and lead editor for numerous bestsellers. When I read his life story, quite frankly, I feel a little bit like an underachiever. He ran a marathon at age 10. He facilitated programs at international conferences at age 14. He's founded multiple organizations, coalitions, and campaigns, as well as serving on a host of boards. The list goes on. So uh, with that, Ocean, I will let you take over and uh, let you uh, have your moment. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sherry. Uh -huh. Well, uh, first, it is an honor to be here in this conversation with thoughtful, intelligent, committed, compassionate humans who are asking how we can live in a good way on this earth. I think we all feel, see, and know that humanity is living in a way that is somehow out of alignment with, uh, with, our, own, uh, with our own sustainability and long-term viability, and certainly with uh, wise stewardship of this earth um, or wise right relation with this earth. We are, we are acting more as a cancer than as a collaborator and we are consuming uh, at an ever increasing rate ecosystems and, and fueling systemic environmental collapse. At the same time, I don't think we are uh, innately destructive. I think we have destructive tendencies. I also think we also have an urge to, li to live and to live in a good way. And that um, the life is moving through us. And that I think this gathering is an expression of that, that uh, as dark as things are, there's also a response that, that emerges, that everywhere there's injustice, there are people working for justice. Everywhere there's war, people are working for peace. Everywhere there's destruction, people are working for healing. And that's what this is about, is human beings who are saying, hey, I want to be a part of something that responds to the violence with something else. And so I am profoundly grateful to be a part of that conversation and a conversation that's looking to transcend the the dogmatism and the fundamentalism that can so often enter. You know, in response, I think, to the degree of heck no that we feel in our bodies to what is happening in the world, some of us become... Um, shall we say self-righteous and some folks who are in the vegan community can get that way about omnivores like you know as if anybody who would ever even think of touching an animal product is evil is a murderer right and and at the same time uh some omnivores or some folks in the let's say the livestock community can can kind of champion regenerative agriculture as if 
cattle are the, are the solution to every problem. And the reality is that um, it's not so simple. I, I, it, honestly, if, if I thought that uh, cows could save the world, I'd be all for it. I mean, I'm for anything that works. Um, even though personally, I don't want to take the life of another animal if I don't need to to survive. That's my own personal ethical sensibility. I'd be all for it politically. However, I think it's more complicated than that. And so I'm an advocate for less meat and for those who are going to eat it, better meat. I don't think that we have the land or the resources to consume meat at the level we are or anything even close to it in anything like a sustainable way. But I do believe that we could produce meat in a far better way that could regenerate soil that could be part of the solution. And so that's something that I'm an advocate for. To me, regenerative agriculture is about restorative ecosystems. It's about sequestering carbon in soil. It's about uh, creating soil that is a sponge for water. It is about pulling water back into our aquifers. It is about restoring our relationship to the natural world. And uh, however much or little part cattle have in that specifically, I want to be very clear that to me it's a much bigger picture. I mean, the, the large scale is there, there are 2,500, uh, 2,500, um, what is it? What is it? It's um, <laughs> tons, 2,500 billion tons, that's what it is, of carbon in our soil, 800 billion tons in the atmosphere, 560 billion tons in plant and animal life. So three times as much carbon is in the soil as is in the atmosphere. And uh, we've lost about 130 billion tons out of the soil that's essentially gone into the atmosphere. So if we can turn that around, we could really uh, create some radical healing for our climate. There's no doubt about it. And that's what I'm passionate about. A Little bit of my story in case folks don't know, my grandpa founded Baskin Robbins Ice Cream Company. My dad, John, walked away from the ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool to follow his own rocky road and ended up becoming a best-selling author himself, writing about food and health, inspiring millions of people to look at their food choices as a chance to make a difference on the planet. Uh, one of his readers ended up being my own grandpa, Irvin Robbins, who later in life wound up crediting my dad's work with saving his life. He gave up ice cream, he gave up sugar, he gave up most animal products, he ate a lot more whole plant foods, and he reversed diabetes and heart disease and obesity. And so I've really seen personally in my family how powerful food can be to harm or to heal. And um, my dad and I launched Food Revolution Network uh, about 10 years ago, but I've actually been active for 30 years leading nonprofits and working around the world. I work with leaders in over 65 countries and I've seen that everybody eats and that what we're eating is having this enormous impact. And as an American, we're exporting ways of growing food and processing food with GMOs and pesticides and factory farms and McDonald's and KFC and Baskin Robbins. And, uh, and that all over the world, waistlines are expanding and hospitals are filling up, obesity rates are rising and people are getting sick with diseases they didn't have before as they try to be more like us. And so as an American, I wanna say, no, don't follow us to the world and also how do we, how do we learn to do something different and to heal? And so that's kind of what's on my mind and, and why I'm here in this conversation. Um, I, I also just want to presence that industrialized meat production is arguably the most destructive force on the planet when it comes to our environment, uh, when it comes to our climate, our water systems, our topsoil, when it comes to ecosystems. A worldwide 83% of farmland is being used for livestock, but for 18% of our calories and 33% of our protein. And uh, that 83% is, is for the most part very destructive and non-sustainable. Um, if you were to, if the world did just go vegan tomorrow, compared to current agricultural systems, we'd free up enough land that's currently being used for livestock. It would be an area the size of China, India, the United States, the European Union and Australia combined. That's how much land would be instantly freed up because it, our current system is so wasteful. So I'm not recommending, I'm not here to say everyone should just go vegan tomorrow, although that is something we might wanna think about. But, but I also think, yes, absolutely not everyone will. And there is a place in the ecosystem for animals. I absolutely believe that. Rightfully, consciously, sustainably managed. And for those of us who do or don't choose to eat them, that's an ethical and human personal choice, but I'm not gonna proselytize that on everybody else. I think there's a place. I just don't think we're doing it right at all.
I appreciate that. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, so many things I wanted to comment on there with all of you whenever you were speaking. Uh, Elizabeth, you were talking about living in relationship. Um, David, also, you were talking about living in relationship with our, with our, you know, with nature. Um, Ocean, you mentioned we're out of alignment. This is about taking control and an opportunity opportunity that we have to either be a part of, as David said, a regenerative system or a degenerative system. I always talk um, a lot in the interviews that I talk about, we have a, a, an option to be a part of the solution or the problem. So um, that is, you mentioned ever, the world going vegan. Uh, is reducing or eliminating meat consumption, is that enough? And, and I will uh, open that up to any of you, but I, I guess Ocean, since you just mentioned it, why don't start with Oh, heck no. <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, we've got more going on than that. But considering that it takes 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef, mm -hmm. you know, it would be a pretty big step all by itself. Um, you know, people talk about how the rainforests are being destroyed for soy plantations. It's true. But those soybeans aren't going to tofu. Those soybeans are going to livestock as well or to soy oil, you know, um, and so and, and highly processed foods. So the reality is that we, we, we've got to change everything, you know, pretty much. Uh, we've got to reinvent our society in so many ways. But there is no question that I, I think to talk about world hunger, to say that, oh, like GMOs or industrialized agriculture are necessary to feed the world is highly ingenuine if you're continuing to eat industrialized meat, uh, wasting 12 pounds of grain or soy for every pound of feedlot beef you're consuming and then saying that you care about the world's hungry. Obviously, you can care, but it's not showing up in that action. So what I want to say is we've definitely got to eat less meat and move in a plant-based direction because let's face it, it takes a lot of um, calories to cycle grain or any product, even grass, through livestock because most of it turns into hoof and hide and bone and energy the animal uses and manure and methane and all the rest. It doesn't turn directly into food. So it's kind of like a protein factory in reverse. That said, well-managed, grass fed, it's possible there are ecosystems in the world that can grow grass and couldn't grow other food humans could eat. And some of those ecosystems well managed can actually, you know, the cattle are pooping, but it's actually replenishing the soil when it's managed properly. And so that can be, I think, a part of the solution uh, when done right. But, you know, chopping down tropical rainforests for grass fed beef is a whole other story. Sure, sure. And it can be fertilizing ground that we could grow other plant-based foods as well. So I think that's an important um, thing to think about as we think about these well-managed systems. Uh, Elizabeth or David, would you like to talk about whether reducing or eliminating meat consumption is enough? Uh, I would like to suggest that we need to stop thinking about extractive linear systems and start to think about integrated systems. We need to start think stop thinking about farms as being farms that you take a resource and at the end you get a product and start thinking about them in terms of a fully integrated system that you manage. So yes, you can get parts of an animal that you don't use, but there's other things within the system where the energy is transferred into other parts of the system. When you're looking at a permaculture based system where for those who don't know, you, you're looking at different layers of growing. So you'll have alley crops, which will be low to the ground. You'll have shrubs, which are a little bit taller, fruit trees perhaps, which are a little bit taller and then nut trees and you know, like chestnuts and so which are even bigger so you really are growing a three-dimensional space you look at it at efficiency and as a vegan and as a landholder that actually wants to start to create um, a regenerative system and, an, and a place for people to understand compassion I would like to see animals within that system but I would choose not to kill them at the end of the process my my role for the animals to provide them with a habitat that is natural to them that is evolved with them that they can help to manage for example I have a enormous stand of Japanese knotweed which is an invasive species and I am just dying to get a bunch of pigs to go and dig that stuff up and experiment to see if that's a way that we can actually get rid of it and just have them use that as the sacrifice zone on the land and have them completely trash it and see what happens so I can see the way that we can live in consort with with animals while also um, increasing efficiency of output of the foods that we're producing because can you imagine one acre flat piece of land yes that's one acre of land but when we're, we're farming layers above that one acre there are many acres of land that are participating and having the animals be part of the nutrient process is wonderful and I've gone to a number of farm sanctuaries and I love the notion of farm sanctuaries to sensitize people to to animals but at the same time I've noticed on just about 
I don't think there's a farm sanctuary that I've ever visited that really shows um, regeneration in, in full capacity that says, this isn't just a pig that's loved in a pen. This is a pig that's loved under an apple tree so that it can forage in the fall and it can be shaded in the summer and there's room for pollinators in the corner over here and it's all an integrated system. And look, we're creating a full sanctuary that is for humans and domesticated animals and wildlife, which is what I want to help to create and start thinking about how does that then we can then translate that into food systems that are not based on annual cropping systems so becoming vegan often the transition foods are soy it's a lot less soy than a, than an animal than a cow eat, it eats in a feedlot but the transitional foods tend to be soy they tend to be genetically engineered we need to be moving to perennial crops we need to be looking at instead of the annual crops that are part of a vegan or a conventional diet what can we be doing with those tree crops so that we can maximize the rotation of animals compassionately or for the food system. Um, and, I, and I have to say that the happiest animals that I have ever seen are always on a regenerative farm. They are not within a farm sanctuary setting. So there is an opportunity for these, these communities to marry these ideas. And I think, again, it's not about a simple transition. Um, I feel better, I, I, would, I, I used to dip in and out of, of non-plant-based foods and now I just don't, I just can't go there. But I fully support those people who feel that they need to for their own health, that's, that's wonderful, you know. Um, but we have the opportunity really to rethink farms from production to actual integrated systems and we are part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask this of the group. David, if you want to take a shot at this, this is great. Um, this is actually for, from one of our um, participants watching. Um, they're asking great questions, so I'm going to ask some of their questions as well. Uh, Jim Goodman wrote, the world is already capable of feeding itself if we let them. Livestock are often an integral part of small uh, holder farmers around the world, providing valuable protein to the diet using crop waste and fitting into a regenerative crop rotation. When the U.S. talks of feeding the world, it is of feeding them a Western diet, uh, which is totally unsustainable. So how do we get the message out that all livestock-based agriculture is not the same, pasture-based versus CAFOs? David, do you want to take that first? So I'm unmuting myself. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's interesting, right? When I was in Ghana visiting our, um, uh, you know, we, we, all of our major uh, uh, materials have really cool stories and farming communities around the world. Um, you know, Tsunami Relief Project turned into our Jennifer Organic Coconut Supply. And um, we have really cool olive uh, projects that we support in Palestine and then also on the Israeli side. But um, it's all regenerative, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, olive oil, and all regenerative and beautiful. Um, but going back to Ghana, uh, just the last time I was there, and, you know, it was just sad to see that the, there's all these chickens just r running around, just eating food waste and, and totally the sustainable meat source locally, but no one's bothering to eat them because there's all these super cheap drumsticks that get dumped, and all the dark meat just gets dumped on the third world at all this, like, ridiculous or developing world at, you know, these ridiculous price points and undercut the local regenerative option. Um, yeah, and it's just so so sad to see, you know, here's these CAFO drumsticks, you know, just completely disrupting what's a inherently regenerative um, supply, like right there locally. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I think uh, how did the message get out? You know, regenerative organic, I mean, we, you know, obviously Patagonia's got a lot of reach and Bronner's and, and you know, we're hoping like as we get it more and more consortium of, of brands and farmers that you will be able to really communicate uh, and you know, in retail store shelves, and um, I don't know every other NGO and organic ad, ad, advocacy organizations, OCA, Compassion World Farming, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, just uh, Oceans Work, and all those different organizations. I mean, you know, all of us together just need to keep um, communicating. But what I'm most excited about is is Kiss the Ground. Uh, Kiss the Ground has been spending like, like almost I don't know the last five years developing this incredible movie. Uh, Kiss the Ground that should is going to be released on Netflix September 22nd and go to Kiss the Ground's website um, We're going to be pumping that as a, as a huge uh, vehicle to educate people about regenerative agriculture and you know this importance of regenerative agriculture to do a good job of, of showing the disaster meat versus regenerative sources if you're going to make that choice um, And yeah to your prior question, you know, I think you know reducing meat and animal products is, is definitely a, a huge part of this equation 
I think the regenerative movement um, could be doing a, a better job at, as a whole, but um, I, I appreciate Kiss the Ground. I appreciate OCA is, you know, really uh, hitting that message. Um, and, uh, you know, like it, it is less meat and better meat. You know, it's like really got to get that less. And as Ocean was saying, I mean, when you make that choice for the CAFO product, you know, chicken or pig or, or beef, you're magnifying everything bad about GMO soy and corn is magnified by that inefficient conversion. You know, and like people complain about the Impossible Burger, which I think is uh, another question on deck. And yeah, it sucks. It's a stupid product. You know, it's just made with GMO soy and, you know, genetic engineered, whatever, you know, heme. Um, but, you know, but compared to what, like, a, like a, you know, any CAFO burgers is going to be 10 times worse and have so much more GMO soy and, and corn and crap in it and antibiotics and all the other crap that goes in a CAFO thing. So, I mean, absolutely don't eat a possible burger, but I mean, even way more, like don't eat a CAFO meat product. Um, so, so yeah, but anyways, yeah, I, I really uh, kiss the ground. Uh, I think it's going to be a great uh, game changing movie and really looking forward to the impact that's going to have. Absolutely. I think the more times we can have conversations like this, the more education that we can do through films and movies and all of the work that all of you do is, is critical to, to being able to tell a different story and to create a different narrative about the realities of what our food system can look like what, versus what it is today. So I appreciate you bringing up the Impossible Burger. So let's talk about fake meat in general. Um, are you for or against it? Pros and cons? Uh, Elizabeth, you want to go? Thank you. Um, I, I very largely agree with what David said um, about the ingredients and genetic engineering. The, the thing to me which was so disingenuous about that that made me so angry was how the company itself put out all the messaging that really it was a front to say, you know, GMOs are fine, they're safe, this is fine, you know, this is compassionate, this is whatever, and it's not, it really wasn't. And so it was, it's helping to lead the, the very compassionate, open-hearted, conscious, plant-based eaters who are trying to make the decision based upon all the principles that they bring to the table, and it was slamming them straight into the wrong direction. Now, Dennis is sitting in the room, in the dining room just behind me, and he's, I haven't cooked a meal this evening, he's a lovely man. He went to the freezer and he pulled out some vegan chicken nuggets, and uh, he actually did that last night because I was busy too. Um, and he's very good at breakfast, but he doesn't do dinner. Um, and so this is, the, you know, this is something that is in the freezer as like the go-to just heat and serve option, but it's not something that I would necessarily call food. It is, you know, it's treat food. And I would love to see a really good organic transitional product. I helped um, the, uh, the Plant-Based Foods Association when they were first establishing, and I fully support the, the, the new, um, you know, cabinets that we're finding in our supermarkets. You know, it, it means that my husband can live because, you know, he can't drink dairy, can't eat cheese, but he was brought up on all these foods and he's had a taste for them. And so, you know, to have an alternative is a wonderful option. I would love to see that I can really go and buy uh, uh, you know, a Miyoko's Kitchen, thank you for, you know, being able to provide an organic, yeah, really, <laughs> David is making a good sign, you know, phenomenal product. But I'd love to see then the other companies follow suit, you know, we're here ready to buy and, uh, and we want to. And so again, this is sort of that balance of, of, of give and take, but, but it's really essential that the vegan community start to take a stand because the alternative meats, the clean meats, that whatever people are lab labeling them and the milks that are gonna start to come on the market as well, are a front for a different kind of genetic engineering. And we need to be vigilant about that. We need a properly clean food supply that's based upon growth in really wonderful soil that is devoid of chemicals and other processes that may or will um, harm us. And so the opportunity we have and then the responsibility we, we have is to help now not be against these companies, but to move them forward. And when that impossible burger came out, I was really saddened because it was an opportunity for the regenerative community to constructively engage and say, look, this is a way that we actually should be moving the food supply. But they didn't. And, it, and I, I even wrote to Regeneration International. I said, please, I want to help you with this conversation because you're pushing people into, who, if they're not eating a bit, you know, the veggie burger, if they're, if they're, if they're against, um, whatever, if they're vegan, then they're against you. And you can't make it about an eating meat or a not eating meat debate. Right. It has to be about a systems conversation. So 
I can yeah. get quite passionate about this particular topic because it angered me on both sides because the opportunity is that middle ground. <laughs> Absolutely. It is an industrial product. And, um, you know, I, I always point to the Impossible Burger as being a really good you know, answer to Jim Goodman's question about how do we tell a story? They pumped a lot of money, a lot of marketing into telling that story. And then they got people who care about the, the climate, who care about, you know, animal welfare and all of these things to buy into that story. And, and they love that product. And regardless of what it is, a, you know, is actually in it. Uh, or what it does to what growing that product or raising that product does to both to their health and to the environment as well. So it's it's an interesting story just to to see how that played out. And and actually, I think it speaks to the power of the consumer to to you know move products along. So if we can get that same story about uh, out about regenerative agriculture as well with the same marketing and the same money and everything that needs to go with it, um, so people can understand how this is also a part of the solution. Hopefully that will help. Uh, Ocean, do you want to weigh in on the Impossible Burger at all? Uh, sure, just to say uh, it's impossible that I'll be eating one anytime soon. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, just to, to compare it, the Beyond Burger is filling a very similar niche. It's lower in saturated fat. It doesn't have GMOs. It's also not a uh, panacea for health lovers. Uh, but I think it's a better alternative if you're cho trying to choose between them. Um, most of the buyers of Impossible Burgers are not hardcore vegans. They're actually people who are choosing it instead of, for example, a Whopper at Burger King. And so I do think that there is less industrialized meat being produced because of it, because that's their market share competition. It's, it's Whopper eaters and the like who, who care about the planet and want to do something a little bit better, but don't really want to compromise on taste or culinary experience and still want to eat a cheap burger at Burger King. So that type of thing, I feel like, yeah, there's a place in the market for that. It's not where I'm interested. It's I'm, I rec I, you know, I founded food revolution network and not food a little bit less bad network. So from my standpoint, we need a fundamental change in how we grow and process and produce and consume food. And that's what I'm interested in. And the Impossible Burger definitely isn't that. Um, but I also believe that, you know, we need creative responses to all kinds of problems. And, you know, I'm not going to war with the Impossible Burger. I'm just kind of ignoring it. You know, like we got better things. Let's focus on real food, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's interesting because we're not, I, we haven't really talked about it, but how do you win over, you know, vegans who really truly passionately care about animals' lives not being ended for food, or, or should I say, we're not probably going to, to, to get them to, you know, understand and really appreciate regenerative agriculture 100%. We're also not going to get everyone to stop eating meat. We're just not in this world, probably, at least not in my lifetime. So how do, someone asked this, one of the uh, participants watching, how do compassionate com communities combine? Where's the middle ground? What can we do to get people to combine or just to, to come closer together like what Elizabeth describes? David, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I wrote a blog uh, called Regenitarians Unite, uh, called uh, be subtitled How the Animal Welfare and Regenerative Agriculture Movements Can Come Together and Sweep Factory Farming Off the Face of the Earth and Mitigate Climate Change and, uh, you know, just make, make, make the world 100% better. Um, and, you know, I think there is, you know, uh, I think the dialogue is, is happening. I think it's better than it was 10 years ago. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think what vegan vegetarians bring to the equation is, is discipline, dietary choice and discipline. And the, the problem I find with like quote unquote ethical omnivore is that it's, it's once you open that channel, it's very hard to be disciplined in, in your choice. Like, and I totally respect it when people are disciplined, but it's just all too often I'll be just having this conversation and someone's just chowing down on the steak at the restaurant or the chicken or the whatever. And it's just like, you know, they, you know it's just a complete disconnect. And, you know, I, I, you know, and absolutely, like, let's not do conventional GMO soy based burgers. And, you know, that that's not the right thing. But, you know, like Ocean says, you know, if it's like a, a choice between the, you know, KFO product and, a, and an impossible burger, I mean, just, you know, that, the impossible burger wins. I mean, it's a, by a lot. And, you know, and I feel like that almond milk often, like, you know, oh, there's so much water it takes for, for almond milk. It's like, well, what about all that GMO alfalfa being grown in Imperial County? I mean, it's just far more water as in cow's milk and, you know, and it's, 
you know, in, in you know, yeah, grass fed dairy. And, and I mean, the, the regenerative options, totally, that's the logic. And, and if you're disciplined, that's 100% part of the equation. Um, and that's it. I mean, you know, vegans need to understand the regenerative options can exist, can and do exist, and how that all works. But then vice versa, that discipline that the vegans are being an equation needs to be appreciated. Like you, your plate is that farm and what is, you know, your fork is a, there's a pitchfork and your knife is a butchery knife. And especially with animal products, it's like, it's a horse show if you're not really being disciplined. And um, so, yeah. So, but again, I think kiss the ground is a, is a good one to really uh, educate in all directions. So. Absolutely. Ocean or Elizabeth, would you like to weigh in on how to, how do we bring commu compassionate communities together? It seems to me that uh, common values, common goals, common enemies all have a way of uniting us. And, um, you know, divide and conquer has a way of dividing us. And so, you know, I, I think that humans generally have far more in common than not. And one of the things that I think is one of the tragedies of our times is how divided we have become that our political dialogue has become, and regardless of your party affiliation, it's been about how do you make the other ones look as bad as possible so that you can win the game. And not about how do we find solutions to our common problems and how do we rise above challenges. And everything has become politicized, you know, because it's all about making the other side look bad, even at the expense of happiness and health and wellness. And um, to me, that's, there's something egregious that we lose about our humanity, no matter what your political orientation is. You know, we all breathe the same air. We all drink the same water at the end of the day. You know, if COVID-19 spreads, it spreads in all of our worlds, you know. And if we obliterate our climate, if we have forest fires that just ravage our homes, if we have hurricanes that tear our communities apart, that affects everybody eventually. And so from my perspective, we have such a common stake in turning things around. And I, I mean stake as in a stake in the ground. I don't necessarily mean what you eat. But, but the, the, the point is that um, I'm for anything that works. And um, to me, if, if you eat less meat and you eat more pasture-raised, you're part of the food revolution. You know, and if you go vegan and you eat an impossible burger sometimes, you're still part of the food revolution. Like we, 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 we can draw these rigid fundamentalist lines. And you know what? If you eat a McDonald's once in a while, but most of the time you're trying to do something different, you can still be part of it. Like it's about a movement. It's about a direction. It's not about, you know, black and white thinking. And there's the good guys and the bad guys and we're at war with each other. I think that most people want a livable planet. Most people want animals to be treated decently. Most people want rainforests to be preserved. You know, most people want a climate that's stable. Most people want good water to drink and good air to breathe, not just for them, but for everybody. And so when we actually realize like a common set of facts, I think we can unite around common goals and values. And so what I always come back to is that, you know, the great peacemakers and leaders down through history have always been people who stood for a higher value than just winning the game at somebody else's expense. And so that's what I, you know, and, uh, you know, Elizabeth, you and Dennis have always stood for that, you know, like politics as a means to an end for a new way of engaging in the public square, you know, where, where ethics and values mean more than, than dog eat dog, you know. And so that's what I want to see us bring to our movements and regenerative agriculture and plant-based eating and, you know, new ways of growing food. Like let's bring compassion and love and common values. And remember, we have so much more in common than, than not. And, you know, Elizabeth, thank you for presencing the role of farmers. I agree. So many of us in the, even in the food movement, think so much from a consumer standpoint that we vilify, like it is hard work to grow food. You know, anybody who's ever growing a tomato plant knows it's like it can get a sore back out there and you think about it on a large scale and all the market pressures and you're up against the CAFOs and the big industries and you know there's so much labor involved and so bless everybody who has the courage and the gumption to say all right I am going to feed people in a good way yeah 
Absolutely. Um, Elizabeth, I'm actually going to come back to you for this question as the last question. I'm going to give you the last word on how communities can come together. So if you want to think about that. In the meantime, I want to talk to David and Ocean. I'll ask them this question and, and let you think on that one. But uh, somebody asked this, and it's a good one. And I, we're getting near the end of the hour, and I want to make sure that we talk about it. Just reducing meat consumption will drive up prices for animal products, supply, and demand. Again, this will disproportionately and negatively affect poor people, mostly people of color. So um, do we have any solution for, and I hear this a lot whenever I'm talking about regenerative agriculture, when I'm talking about, you know, getting locally raised foods, et cetera, it's, it is not always possible to eat these foods for people. So, so the comment is if we reduce... Uh, Meat consumption will drive well, up prices for animal products, supply and demand. Um, well, I mean, it actually goes the other way. I mean, if you, know, if you, if you increase demand, that drives up, uh, you know, and you have scarce supply, that's what uh, uh, drives up the demand. So reducing would actually create a quote-unquote glut that would drive down prices, you know, hypothetically. But I think the more the intent is uh, if people were to uh, adopt, um, let's say, grass-fed, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, you know, people need to eat CAFO chicken and, and pigs, and that's the only way. We can feed people and, and that's the only way people can eat meat and they, they need to eat these CAFO animal products and, and that's just the, the, the right thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's wrong. I think it's, it's not. I think everyone, regardless of your, 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 your income class, you have a responsibility to the welfare of the animal that you're choosing to eat. Um, that's, a, that's a sentient being. And how would you raise that animal? And you know, would you raise it in a tiny little cage and have, make it have a miserable life and feed it a whole bunch of antibiotics? Or, he has huge weight gain and just has all kinds of horrible sores and misery and it's the best day is the last day of, a, of his life or would you raise it in a cool way and you know let it have you know fulfill its life and you know, maybe spend a little more of your energy time and money to, to raise that animal correctly and so I think people should basically you know eat you know half as much and pay twice as much for, for their meat like regardless everywhere you're at that's just like half as much and pay twice twice for it I think that's a good rule of thumb when it comes to animal products. Um, and that would be just way better for, for all around. Yeah, Ocean, would you like to add anything? Um, I just, I think that we do have to look at the economic side of food because uh, there's this uh, very unfortunate um, framing that's happened that healthy food is some kind of elitist luxury and that whole foods take your whole paycheck. And yes, there are a lot of um, very expensive foods there's a lot of money to be made catering to the wealthy, and there have been a lot of very expensive foods aimed at that market. Uh, Dr. Bronner's, I think, has been a good example of the fact that you can also provide really high quality, wonderful things to very large numbers of people without charging an arm and a leg for it. Um, when you have certain ethics built into your company and your values, you know. Um, but um, we, we really have to recognize that you can eat very well on very little money. And uh, I grew up, you know, in a family living in the middle of the woods in British Columbia, Canada, where we grew most of their own food. And our staples were brown rice and legumes and cabbage and carrots and onions and a lot of stuff we grew in the garden and lots of kale. And so I want to just invite all of us to remember, yeah, if you've got plenty of money and you want to invest in really expensive stuff, like that's your choice. And I agree with you, David, that we need less meat. And then the meat, if, if we didn't have all these marketplace distortions, like subsidized CAFO feedstuffs, we would definitely see much more expensive meat and we shouldn't expect like trying to drive the price down by outsourcing all of the ecological devastation and worker mistreatment and animal mistreatment. We should, you know, pay what things really cost and then we'd see that animal products are pretty darn expensive. Um, but at the same time, remember, you can base your diet around real whole simple natural foods that are produced sustainably, grown organically, often grown locally, and, um, you know, that's, that's something that's in reach for just about all of us. Thank you. Elizabeth, I will leave it to you to talk uh, back to that uh, question about how do we bring compassionate communities together? Thank you. I, I'd also just, if I may, just for a second, you know, I did, I worked, as I mentioned before, for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. 
And part of this discussion about regeneration is also resilience. It's not just resilience of the environment and compassion for the animal, it's compassion for the human too. And it's about violence that is waged upon uh, humans, both in the system of production and also in the system of, pr of consumption. And when we look at our um, communities that are most vulnerable, that are most economically vulnerable, um, they're suffering from the foods that they're eating. Um, they're suffering from high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, all of these preventable and mm -hmm. reversible um, illnesses that are largely based around food and consumption. And the issue is there's not enough food or education to be able to show them. And the paychecks are actually going to drugs that are then, you know, the profit is going to the drug company instead of truly, which is sub suppressing that illness, instead of actually feeling the person. So I think there's a much bigger conversation there. When we talk about the communities themselves, um, just as Ocean said, we, we um, bring the community together by meeting each other compassionately and with open hearts and not with fear or judgment. There's a lot that we can learn from one another. And we really need to understand the way that the world works. We need to understand the way our bodies work. We need to understand our hearts. We need to understand that when we eat violence, we have that energy inside us. And very often we become more violent. If you look at Michio Kushi's work and, um, and the microbiotic um, understanding, then that is endemic all the way through it. And so we need to stop fighting for our little territory and start actually opening to each other. Um, when Dennis was in Congress, that's what we did. You know, we. We fought hard on the issues, but we were soft on the people. Because as all, if you fight personally and attack individuals, you never give the person the opportunity to think. And because they're too busy protecting themselves and digging in, and you know, you put an animal in a corner, it's going to probably come back at you. And so, you know, in all of these situations, we need to actually have compassion and openness, listening, learning, and then we have the opportunity to have, you know, the vegan community don't have all the answers, the regenerative community don't have all the answers, but together there's a conscious that we know that we're trying to birth into existence on this planet in order to tra transform the trajectory of the future that we see in the world. And it happens, it starts, I don't find a cliche, but it starts truly within ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you for that. So I will uh, close this out. I feel the need to quote my friend, uh, Mike Calicrate. He's a farmer. He's a rancher. He's also an advocate who inspires me um, almost daily. And he says all, all the time, if people could, t and I'm going to mess this quote up, but he basically says, if people could taste the animal suffering, the decimation of rural communities, the environmental pollution, and the toll on the family farm and farm workers, each time they eat industrially raised meat, they would never take a bite of that product. And so I want to um, just, that's, uh, you know, I want to leave it with that and, and just encourage everyone to look at regenerative agriculture, to look at vegetarianism and veganism, veganism, and to understand that we can all make changes in our lives and we can all contribute to a solution rather than um, being part of the problem. So um, you all give me hope. Thank you for talking to me tonight and thank you for sharing your thoughts with, with our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. you guys rock. I am. <laughs>